Welcome to my classroom. In this fuel cells and batteries course, in this model number three, we have been discussing about high temperature fuel cells. And in the previous lecture, we have started with solid oxide fuel cells, where we have discussed about the principles of solid oxide fuel cells, what are the advantages and the challenges associated with solid oxide fuel cells. And we have seen what are the various possible rate determining steps that can be present in uh, solid oxide fuel cells. And also we have seen one of the problem associated with uh, solid oxide fuel cell is about carbon deposition and what are the different ways or different stages in which this carbon deposition takes place and how it affects the performance of the solid oxide fuel cell. And with respect to design strategies, we have discussed about the three type of things that is that uh, external reforming, internal reforming, even within internal reforming, we can have a separate catalyst or we can even make anode uh, with uh, ca catalyst for the stream reforming also can be incorporated. Such all the design strategies have been discussed, right? So in this lecture, we are going to discuss about different components, materials like cathode, anode, electrolyte, uh, then we have sealants and we have interconnector, all that. Okay, So we will discuss about what are the desired characteristics of anode material, cathode material, electrolyte, and then we have interconnector. What is an interconnector? What are the materials which have been used as interconnector? And what is a sealant? All that we will discuss in this lecture in detail. Ready? Six of each material we should know, particularly about electrolyte, cathode and anode, we will look into detail. So, if you start with cathode material, we have seen in cathode what is happening, oxygen combines with the electrons to form oxygen ions, right? So, what we should have, that cathode material should have high electronic conductivity to reach, the, allow the electrons to reach to the site. And what about its chemical and dimensional stability? Because air is coming into picture, we are having different phase, okay? So, the design temperature is around 1000 degree means. So, you should have a chemical and dimensional stability in the air because there should be no air corrosion, uh, corrosion due to air should take place. And the thermal expansion compatibility with other layer cell, we have seen, seen this in uh, molten carbonate fuel cell also. All the three material that we use, anode, cathode and uh, electrolyte should have similar range of thermal expansion should be there. Okay. And this particular cathode material, we know that raw material is oxygen. So, solubility or diffusivity or this uh, so diffusivity of oxygen through these pores should be more. So, we should have some sufficient porosity for the mass transfer to take place, that oxygen to diffuse through it. Okay. So, these are some of the requirements of cathode material. And moving on to electrolyte material, we know that it should be, it should not conduct the electron. Okay, so it should be a dielectric and it should have high oxygen ion conductivity, O2 minus conductivity should be high because that is the purpose of electrolyte, right? O2 minus ion should pass from cathode side to anode side. It should not allow electrons to pass through it. So those two are primary requirements of an electrolyte material. And coming to operational thing, we should have a dimensional and chemical stability both in air as well as in the fuel because in one side we are it is dealing with uh, a cathode side we are sending air in anode side we are sending uh, gases fuels okay so up to this design temperature it should be chemically stable it should not react with those things okay and similarly thermal expansion compatibility with the other two materials cathode and anode should be there and it should
So different materials can be used. Okay, so that is the this diagram gives you a wide idea idea range of material which have been used. Okay, so anode of a solid oxide fuel cell will be made up of M1, M2, C1, C2. What is M1, M2, C1, C2? M1 is single metal one, and you you can have a metal alloy of M1 and M2. There can we can choose. Here. You have a list of metals, different metal that can be used here. Okay, you can see here. You have nickel, copper, iron, molybdenum, silver, palladium, ruthenium, platinum. Okay, tin, zinc, cobalt. Everything is there, right? So any two metal can be used. We made a, into a metal alloy first. Okay, and then we will be treating it with ion conductors, oxide ion conductor to increase its conductivity for oxygen. What we will do? Oxide ion conductor C one we have to add. What is that? Doped CO two, yttrium, stabilized zirconia, stabilized zirconium oxide. Okay, so we can use make use of that also. Then perovskite material also can be used because they are mixed ionic electronic uh, conductor. Okay, so that makes one of the solid oxide fuel cell. You can have a metal alloy and you have a electrolyte material, stabilized yttrium, stabilized zirconium type of material. Then you are having A cathode side material, which is perovskite. Okay, and then talk about the perovskite material. So we'll just slowly you see what is a perovskite. All that we have discussed in previous lecture. You can see what are the different methods which are being used to produce. These are the top ten uh, perovskite materials. Okay, so you have you have seen the DAB three, right? So A, B, three. So we what are the D, A, B, and three? You can see here. So different combination is there. Okay. So we can make use of them. So we have a list of different method like solid state method. You can produce. We can produce by solid state reaction methods. Okay. We have EDTA method. Okay. So even there are some tape casting method also there by which we can produce all these kind of materials. Okay. And we have seen this is a comparison of different available materials for electrolyte cathode and anode from literature. So you can see that it should electrolyte should have physically it is a gas state dense layer. Different materials like uh, yttrium, stabilized zirconium, you have other list here. Okay, so these are some of the materials which are widely used for uh, solid oxide fuel cell applications as anode, cathode, and electrolyte. Okay. And one, if I ask me from this list, which is the best combination or widely used one, you can see that the material which satisfy the requirements are for cathode, it is strontium doped lanthanum manganite, okay, and as yttrium doped or stabilized zirconium oxide, and a mixture of a nickel metal and yttrium stabilized zirconium oxide as the anode material, okay. Uh, what is doped fund? When you say doped, means it is added in a very small quantity. Okay, so these are the small amounts of other elements add, added to achieve some of the desired properties. Okay, so here you have a picture of a twenty solid oxide fuel cells uh, in one. Okay, so which is being used to study a hybrid combined heat and power system. So they are giving at least eighty percent efficiency. Okay. And this is a particular product uh, specification of your LSM twenty. So A, B, C you have. Okay. So to summarize, these uh, solid oxide fuel cells operate at temperatures at which certain ox uh, oxidic electrolytes become oxygen ion conducting. It is the same effect that takes place in the lambda sensor supplied with the three-way catalytic converter in spark ignition cars or lambda sensors. Can be used as a convenient lab model for a solid oxide fuel cells. So these oxide solid oxide employed are mixtures of yttria and zirconia, and their use goes back as far as early work by Nernst, which we have discussed. So the solid oxide fuel cell benefits from excellent kinetics at the anode and cathode. However, for the thermodynamic reasons, the reversible potential at the operating temperature is somewhat lower than for low temperature fuel cells. The planar design follows the same principle as discussed with the other fuels. While currently, for more for the most advanced design is that of the tube bundles, which have been developed by the Westinghouse. They have been doing this since mid 1960s, which is now commercialized by Siemens Westinghouse. Okay. 
there are different criteria that needs to be met for electrolyte to be select it must be dense and leak tight it should be stable in reducing and oxidizing environment it should be a good ionic conductor at operating temperature it should be non electron conductor it should be thin to reduce the ionic resistance it is extended in area for a maximum current capacity it should have a good thermal shock resistant and it should be economically processable okay and there are other materials which are used other than perovskites or lamox family lamox family refers to lanthanum molybdate material base material la2mo2o9 so the structure of that you can see that when you are when it is simple also you can see that the tra- above this transition which takes place around 580 degrees celsius that is what transition you have alpha form to beta form the transition from slightly distorted low temperature alpha form to a cubic high temperature beta b form it is accompanied by an abrupt increase by almost two orders of magnitude when i say two orders of magnitude you one order mean 10 times when i say two orders of magnitude it is 100 times so the anionic conductivity that is o2 minus ion conductivity increases 100 times when we are uh, operating above this b alpha form to low temperature alpha form to high temperature beta form conversion so at this high temperature beta form that is above 600 degrees celsius this material whether it is simply lanthanum molybdate or it is treated with something else substituted with something so they have very good increase in the ionic conductivity that what you can see from this diagram the arrhenius plot of conductivity of pure uh, this uh, lanthanum lamox series and when it is treated okay so we have so when it is substituted with something else you can see that it is substituted with chromium it is substituted with potassium okay, uh, barium like that so you have that it's uh, at least 100 times we have increase in the ionic conductivity when it is uh, moving from alpha phase to beta phase okay so even the fluoride oxides are some of the most common and classical oxygen ion conducting materials So the crystal structure consists of a cubic oxygen lattice with alternate body centers occupied by eight coordinated cations. So the cations are arranged into a face-centered cubic structure with the anions occupying the tetrahedral sides. So that leaves a rather open structure with large octahedral interstitial void. Okay, so you can see this material. So the general formula has the form of O2, where A is usually a big tetravalent cation like U, T, H, or C. Okay. uranium thorium and selenium so since is zirconium ion 4 plus ions is too small to sustain the fluoride structure at low temperature it has to be partly substituted with some larger cation called dopant so that is where the role of a dopant material coming into picture so the doping involves usually substituting some lower valence electric cations into the lattice so in order to maintain a charge neutrality oxygen vacancies have to be introduced which will allow the oxygen ion migration so how we do that by substituting the host cation sites with either rare earths or alkaline earth elements such as yttria stabilized zirconia a increase in ionic conductivity can be achieved so zirconia oxide which is z zirconium oxide in its pure form has a high melting temperature and a low thermal conductivity so that's why the application of pure zirconia are restricted because it shows some polymorphism it is a monoclinic at room temperature and it changes to denser tetragonal phase from uh, temp- higher temperatures also okay it involves a large change in the volume and which causes some extensive thermal cracking and zirconia has a low thermal shock resistivity so that way when you add some oxide materials resulting in stabilizing the cubic phase and the creation of one oxygen vacancy so that way we use st- the zirconia when it is stabilized with 3 mole percentage of o2 o3 yttria okay so we are 8 mole percent yttria which is represented as 3 ys is it or 8 ys is it it means that 8 mole percent and 3 mole percent uh, but it is not uh, this ys is that without this doping is not the best ion conductor but it is the cheapest to process and has a low enough electronic conductivity there are many other materials that conduct the oxides but the advantages of this yttria stable zirconia is abundant it's available widely you have chemi- it's provide very good chemical stability it is non toxic 
and it is cheaper economics makes it the most suitable material at present so currently yttria stabilized zirconia is used as the electrolyte material as the first choice and there are some drawbacks associated with it which you can go through okay and i'll just focus on how these zirconia electrolyte films are being made first okay that's my concern here so i'll tell you about it can be done either through vapor deposition or tape casting okay and uh, even the second highly interesting group other than this why is that is that is perovskites okay the generally the, we know the structure of perovskites which we are discussing in previous lecture okay so there are different type of perovskite which are being there you can make use of them at, uh, because which helps us to reduce the operating temperature to 600 to 800 degrees celsius and even the electrolyte layer thickness cannot exceed 20 mm to ensure the we have some enough conductivity and how this mea is prepared as i told you how this electrolyte uh, this membrane anode and cathode uh, mea is prepared is usually first what we will do is we have to make this zirconia oxide powder then we will have add binder plasticizer and solvent and we mix it we do it the milling ball milling is done like mechanical operations lab you might have done that this to this so we make a powder and we keep it in vacuum condition then we use a tape casting method so in tape casting method what we do is we prepare a slurry out of it okay we have used the solvent plasticizer everything right it's like a paste we make out of it then that slurry is filled in this one then you have a doctor's blade which will only allow the minimum thickness to be maintained and this thing will be keep moving which i will show you later with the video so tape casting method we prepare this thickness then we make a thing and we make lamination we do some cold isostatic pressing then we uh, binding binder burn or extra additional binder and sintering we do finally we get a densified ceramic material that is how we prepare a ceramic electrolyte membrane okay in general this is a procedure general procedure not only for solid exit fail cell anywhere you want to make a membrane of ceramic um, it is the procedure is being followed so what is this tape casting procedure tape casting is just uh, thing like you have a casting machine we have so there will be two reels will be there it, it will be moving from left hand to right like conveyor belt so on which we just uh, make our own material and dry tape will keep so we put our materials into it okay so there is a doctor blade we first fill the as i told you we make a paste slurry that homogeneous slurry is added in the slurry container it is getting released on this over it okay so as it moves here we have a blower we will have a heater so which will evaporate all the solvent so we have drying taking place it's like from soap addition ex- excess moisture has to be removed right so it is like a typical drying unit we are we are, we are making a slurry but we have a doctor blade which is like with thickness is controlled that particular thickness of wet tape comes here we have some heater arrangement so you have that uh, evaporation of solvent taking place so we get a dry tape which collect it here and roll it and we use that tape. okay so additional processing such as you can use printing laminating firing also can be done so this essentially consists of some units like glass bed a carrier film a slip a doctor blade and precision height adjustment what should be the thickness with that we will adjust the height of the doctor blade so that the minimum thickness is maintained okay so that way this is called electro- this is way the fabricate the electrolyte so apart from electrochemical vapor deposition the more more conventional and industrial method use this tape casting okay so in tape casting is used to produce some thin foils or tapes or for hard or protective coatings using a powder binder slurry typically binder material we use are acrylic waxes pva that is poly or polyvinyl butyrol dissolved in proper solvent and we use some plasticizer like peg for providing some stability so typically we load the slurry into a moving paper or a plastic sheet that passes through a controlled opening provided by a blade called as doctor's blade this blade will help provides us the spreading the slurry into a thin continuous sheet the th- thickness is controlled by using the gap between what is the blade and the sheet okay so the sheet can either cut into required size or spool 
the sheet can be dried to moving it through some heater and drying oven to evaporate all the solvents and then we do sintering also how to make slurry this is one of the example for solid oxide fuel cells one of the slurry preparation method we have to explain let us explain go through this so first thing is we will have some zirconium oxide powder stabilized one we will take some 15 grams and we will take some 10 ml of solvent different solvent can be used you can use any alcohol or you can use a azeotropic mixture of ethanol and methyl ethyl ketone or typically you can use this mixture of xylene toluene okay so that way the solvent is taken 10 ml 20 ml total so we add 15 grams of zirconium oxide powder into 20 ml of solvent then we add some ml 0.5 ml of dispersant which is triphenol or even you can use phosphate ester 0.4 ml and then we use the plasticizer material okay so polyethylene glycol you can use okay yeah, 1.3 ml we will add then you have dibutyl phthalate you can add 1 ml okay then we add the binder material pvb which is polyvinyl butyrol which is a resin which is mainly used for various application like wherever we need strong binding optical clarity and you want addition to the many surface void of toughness and flexibility so that way we use as a powder along with the solvent dispersant to plasticizer and binder to make our paste okay so slurry is prepared in this way we have to optimize eh? by doing research means uh, systematically we have to take in different proportion and find what is optimum condition this is reported in one of the literature where which they produced for mainly for the solid acid fuel cell so they made a sintered tape and they made even the anode so you can see the thickness 3 cm almost so 1 to 3 minus 2 cm uh, membrane they cut they make square then we cut it out to required shape that's what being done okay so that way we make a anode material then we prepare a membrane electrode assembly out of it okay so that is a fabrication technique we have, we have been explaining you this video will show you how to make this. what is the cutting is a typical tape test unit okay. so in this we fill the slurry they are pouring the slurry it is like high viscous low viscous okay so with time this viscosity will change okay so we prepare slurry paste and we have a doctor blade there so which will only also height adjustment will be there so that we will it will allow only a small layer of this uh, slurry to have a particular thickness and spread over the sheet which is moving okay so you can see that this this sheet is moving from that side to the uh, opposite direction okay so there is a emergency stop button so we have a thickness like this so it is getting spread it is like a conveyor belt as i told you you can adjust the speed at which the belt the conveyor belt is operating so that the, it will be moving so it is as it moves from right hand side to left hand side or left hand side to right hand side what happens is it is getting dried whatever excess solvent are there it will get vaporized even sometimes we can air air blower hot air can come in and it can go out okay so what happens so that time this uh, whatever extra material solvent will get vaporized so you get dry material wet membrane thickness you see we are having very good uniform thickness over here right so that's what we get okay. we can observe it through this glass in we are also having in our master answer laboratory one setup like this so if you are interested to do your next year project in working on membrane preparation all that you are welcome to do research well in planar fuel cells uh, we have some limitations in solid oxide fuel cells you can see the thickness already i told you and they shown you the photo also it a uh, five fuel cell will only have 2 mm thickness so that is the thickness wafer type we can make okay but in the tubular design air is supplied to the inside of an extended solid oxide tube which is sealed at the one end while the fuel flows round the outside of the tube actually the tube itself forms a cathode and the cell components are constructed in layers around the tube okay but there are some issues as i told you it will be tap casting integral assembly we make this me assembly all that okay but 
there are some as uh, problems associated with it okay the planar cell in which the electrolyte and the electrodes are formed into a flat wafer is the easiest and therefore the cheapest way to fabricate but however the interconnecting structures that are required to form the cells into in stacks have to be fed air to the cathode of one cell and hydrogen are fed to the anode of the adjacent cell without allowing them to mix together right so the sealing high temperature solid state field cells to prevent the gas feed mixture is one of the major challenges in this flat tubes flat means for planar field cells solid oxide field cells so the gas management to ensure the even supply across the planar surface is also an important consideration so that is where this uh, angular fuel cell membranes come into picture similar to your roa membranes for your water purification at homes so the solid oxide fuel cell is this type so what happens is all air will go in one at the center portion and you have a electrolyte at least layers and then outside only fuel is flowing so there is no mixture of oxygen and the sorry mixture of fuel and the oxygen within the system when you do it in this way okay it's like a cylinder okay it's like a annular cylinder you have a layer of anode we have a layer of cathode because where you are sending air that side will be cathode okay so where you are sending your fuel that side will be anode so outside it should be anode so this green color here this and this you don't confuse if you side this front view and angle view alone what we have is outermost layer that green layer is uh, this cylinder is anode outside which we are suffering allowing the fuel to pass through and after that we have inner layer which is made up of your electrolyte after that we have pink color or what you call that violet color you have that catalyst which is a anode so you have anode ca electrolyte and cathode in three cylinder forms so which is like a three cylinder one inside another we have so that makes us this so which separates the air and oxygen without getting mixed we are able to uh, gas management is done easily so that is the advantage of using such uh, type of design okay so that way this is called tubular solid oxide fuel cell but in tubular of solid oxide fuel cell how to collect the current right current electron has to be collected right so we have an additional thing called as interconnector okay so it is called interconnection so which will will put a clip here, here and we will collect the electrodes there. so that way how it looks like so this current collector interconnection is there it is like a ring with opening here so you can see that it is there we connect the, the electron so that way the electrons are being taken out so this electron going outside of this that is we need a interconnector so we should look into what is the interconnector so in type in this type of uh, uh, fuel cell where we have a tubular solid oxide fuel cells outside you are having fuel that is uh, anode is there outside permeable anode electrolyte and then permeable cathode so in inside it is like inside and outside it's like if you see the cross section so it is the fuel is at the outermost layer and air is going at the center center vacant position or central part of that term. okay so what is that uh, air is going only oxygen is reaching the surface of the cathode and then it is making oxygen ions so, so this oxygen ions uh, passing to the impermeable electrolyte so there this oxygen ions and hydrogen reacts to form water and electrolyte electrons so this electron will flow through the external circuit and come back here so this is a typical functioning of a tubular solid oxide fuel cells so what is happening i have told you anode is exposed to the cathode where it breaks up to produce oxygen ions the oxygen ion passes through the vacancies in the solid ceramic electrolyte to get to the anode surface and splitting apart the hydrogen molecules produces the electrons and these electrons are routed through an external load and then returned by the bridge to the cathode where they are consumed when the oxygen is split apart at the anode we have hydrogen is broken apart into ions and combines with the oxygen ions to produce the water this water will diffuse out of the anode and leaves with any unspent fuel so the reaction taking place is again given here what happens with h plus ions or oxygen ions oh ions and carbonate ions okay so 
so this is for any fuel cell so in this case it is oxygen ion what is there this is for solid oxide fuel cell this is applicable for acid fuel cell okay phosphoric acid fuel cell okay this is for molten carbonate fuel cell so this is overall reactions for all four type of uh, diffusion of different electrolytes okay Three, two, one, go. So these are the reaction mechanisms that is taking place at anode and cathode for different conducting ions in electrolytes. We know that this solid oxide fuel cell is one of the most efficient technologies for power generation because it is flexible to fuel choice and it produces less noise and it shows low carbon dioxide emissions. And it has a potentially long lifetime of around 40,000 to 80,000 hours. And if you look at this solid oxide fuel cell, it typically employs some yttrium stabilized zirconia electrolyte. The cathode of the solid oxide fuel cell absorbs oxygen molecules from the oxidant gas and reduces them to negative oxygen ions, that is O2 minus, and which, which passes through the electrolyte and reaches the anode side where the reaction takes place which we have discussed in a previous lecture. I have even shown an animation for that. Please refer to the video. And the cathode of the solid oxide fuel cell absorbs the oxygen molecules from the oxygen gas and it reduces them to negative oxygen ions. The chemical potential gradient passes these ions through the electrolyte to the anode fed by the fuel. Then the oxygen ions oxidize the diffused fuel catalytically leading to generation of the electrons. Finally, an external circuit transfers the released electrons to the cathode to complement the discharge process. The schematic of this SOFC and its working principle we have already discussed. And if you look at this high working temperature of the solid fuel cell, it, we have certain uh, advantages such as it, it gives us the ability to reach an adequate ionic conductivity. It provides excellent heat byproducts for using it as combined cycle operations or we call it as co-generation of energy. And another merit for this thing is we are using solid state electrolyte which is manageable and it does not cause any corrosion to the cell or we don't face any handling issues in different angles. Moreover, the solid oxide fuel cells are more cost effective also when you are doing it in mass production because they don't need any expensive precious metals or noble metals like platinum. And even the harsh operating conditions in SOFCs, uh, we have like high working temperature, we have reduction thermal cycling and poisonous atmosphere. All they need is, they need a proper material for their components. The component may be electrolyte, anode, interconnector or sealant. Okay, so the required several properties for the components can be listed as appropriate conductivity. Electrolyte must be an electronic insulator providing a good ionic conductivity while electrodes should show a promising electronic and ionic conductivity. And if we look at the stability, uh, you should have an acceptable stability in terms of chemical stability, thermal stability, morphological stability as well as mechanical stability. And because since there are so many components like uh, sealant, we have interconnector, we have cathode, anode and electrolyte, good compatibility with other components in terms of chemical compatibility, thermal compatibility and mechanical compatibility which means that the thermal expansion coefficient should be in the same order for all these components that we are using. And pore structure for the electrodes because we need to have adequate mass transport of either hydrogen in the one side or oxygen in the another side. We need to have adequate gas transportation to the reaction sites at the anode as well as in the cathode. And we want to have a dense electrolyte because we don't want uh, gas mixing to occur because one side we have hydrogen and then products are formed in another side oxygen and we have some products formed. So we don't want these gases to get mixed. So these materials whatever you are using for electrode should prevent gas mixing. And if you look at these materials, we want to have high electrical conductivity, we want to have perfect gas tightness and high resistivity against oxidation, sulfation and carbon deposition for interconnects. 
and hermeticity and insulating nature for the sealants are also important okay and besides this all these materials should be cost effective and they should able they should be easily machinable or you can say it should be easy to fabricate okay so with all these prerequisites there are different materials which are available for solid oxide fuel cell applications and in case of the oxide ion solid oxide fuel cells which we write it as OSOFC electrolytes are mostly composed of perovskite or fluoride structure with oxygen deficiency to provide oxygen pathways by oxygen vacancies even we can use zirconia based or ceria based or gadolinia based doped ceria and lanthanum galenate based materials okay so the different materials are most common example for um, this uh, what do you call oxide ion diffusing solid oxide fuel cells on the other hand there is a solid oxide fuel cell which is proton conducting model also there where there will be transport of h plus ions instead of oxygen ions and there is no generated water molecule at the anode side which brings several advantages such as high performance at low operating temperatures and better durability in using hydrocarbon fuels for this type of uh, means for this type of hydrogen ion conducting solid oxide fuel cells we use barium cerium oxide barium zirconium oxide based perovskites okay with a different composition and they are some of the popular electrolytes listed here and even cathodes are also different for oxygen ion conducting electrolyte solid oxide fuel cells and hydrogen ion conducting solid oxide fuel cells so if it is oxygen ion solid oxide fuel cells cathode material mainly used are perovskites which is having a structure of abx3 okay so made up of lanthanum strontium all that okay and we can use cathode material for hydrogen solid oxide fuel cells because in if you want to have h plus ions to conduct hso f3 requires three charge carriers of o2 minus ions h plus ions and electrons to show the acceptable performance so we will be mixing the proton conducting oxides with oxygen conductors which will be the key to provide an effective electrode reactions for hydrogen ion conducting solid oxide fuel cells okay so this is a diagram for a solid oxide fuel cell which h plus ion conducting okay so we can go through it okay <clears throat> and more in the previous lecture we have discussed about the different support material for this uh, solid oxide fuel cell i mean that for a planar and tubular surface fuel cell can be either supported by anode or it can be a cathode supported okay so that we can see that in this diagram you can see the cross section diagrams of the electrolyte supported cells anode supported cells or cathode supported cells which means that that will be the maximum thickness okay whichever it is supporting that thickness is more other two are the minimum thickness okay so that is a case for even planar geometries as well as tubular geometries okay and the solid oxide fuel cells are also called as ceramic fuel cells because ceramic is being used as the electrolyte okay so generally fuel cells are named with their electrolyte right so based on ceramic being used as the electrolyte so it is called as ceramic fuel cells or you can generally call it as solid oxide fuel cells you know when nernst uh, identified the effect of zirconium oxide as the electrolyte so what he did is he he proposed to use solid compositions such as zirconium oxide with 15 white percent yttrium oxide uh, okay so together that is generally called as nernst mass as a glower to replace the carbon filaments in the electric lamps we hope tungsten is being used in electric lamps right so even he proposed the zirconium oxide with 15% yttrium oxide which is also called as nernst mass to be used as a nernst glower because these nernst glowers are used to operate for hundreds of hours on direct current itself though the electrolysis was found to occur so it was even explained that any loss of oxygen liberated at the anode was balanced by an equal amount of oxygen taken into the glower at the cathode so this is actually a reverse process of a fuel cell operation because electrolysis we know that electrolysis is a reverse of a fuel cell right so here the oxygen is being consumed 
okay so wherever it is a loss of oxygen any loss of oxygen liberated at the anode is balanced by the equivalent amount of oxygen consumed into the blow air at the cathode so this is the phenomena which is reverse of fuel cell operation so even in 1935 scott key published a paper he was suggested that if you are using the nernst mass we can even use it as a fuel cell electrolyte and then only in 1937 bauer and price demonstrated the operation of first solid oxide fuel cell which you can call it as ceramic fuel cells so they used mainly zirconium oxide based ionic conductors particularly when you are doping it with the 10 white percent magnesium oxide or 15 white percent yttrium oxide so this main material is zirconium oxide ceramic material okay so they used it in the form of a tubular crucible as the electrolyte with iron and carbon as the anode material and iron oxide as the cathode material so even the open circuit voltage between 1.1 volt to 1.2 voltage at the elevated pressures have been reported okay and mainly these solid oxide fuel cells which was made in early days they used noble metals like platinum as the electrode and interconnect material however in early 1970s it was replaced with the nickel doped nickel doped with yttrium oxides okay so various materials have been used as the anode cathode and interconnect material respectively and this particularly cobalt chromium oxide was later replaced by lanth lanthanum chromium oxide and in 1980s lanthanum magnesium oxide manganese oxide and lanthanum cobalt oxides were proposed for the cathode material and recently these high temperature alloys have been tested as interconnector material for flat plate solid oxide fuel cells and if you look at the typical operating temperature ranges for different oxide fuel cells in comparison to polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cells solid oxide fuel cells can operate between the range of 500 to 1000 and polymer electrolyte can be operated between 50 to 100 and molten carbonate at the average of 600 to 650 okay so if you compare the power generation or capacity of a plant okay with respect to operating temperature if you look have a plot of efficiency versus power plot you can see that different fuel cells for example steam turbines with the increase in capacity you have increase in the efficiency okay when, when you are operating at lower capacity we are going to have lower efficiency when you operate at higher capacity we are going to have higher efficiency so for example steam turbine the efficiency which varies from 10 when you are operating at 30 kilowatts and when you are operating it at 200,000 kilowatt it is efficiency maximum is around 50 percentage and if you have a diesel generators efficiency varies from 30 to 50 from fuel cells you can see that you have efficiency varying from 40 to 45 and ceramic gas turbines have efficiency varying from 35 to 70 and if you come to these solid oxide fuel cells you can see the initial efficiency even when you are operating at very low capacity of 30 kilowatts the efficiency is around 50 and when you are operating at around 200,000 kilowatts we have an efficiency of 70 percentage so what you can see here is 200 kilowatt and larger use bottoming cycle to the solid oxide fuel cells when you use this 200 kilowatt and larger will be using bottoming cycles and third one is polymer electrolyte fuel cell the efficiency when we are using methane is the fuel okay in case of four steam turbine there is some potential for the ceramic boilers and turbines so the point we want to take from this graph is solid oxide fuel cells have a very high efficiency among all the other type of power generating units like polymer electrolyte membrane fuel cell solid oxide fuel cells uh, sorry molten carbonate fuel cells or steam turbine fuel cells so the power generating unit and if you look at the efficiency of fuel cells and typical fossil fuel power sources if you want to compare in terms of values you can see that alkaline fuel cells efficiency is greater than 70 60 percentage we have proton exchange membrane fuel cell which has when you use hydrogen as a fuel has an efficiency of 60 percentage when you use natural gases you have efficiency of 40 percent 
when you use phosphoric acid as the electrolyte that phosphoric acid fuel cell has efficiency around 36 percentage to 42 percent molten carbonate fuel cells have an efficiency of around 50 percentage and we have solid oxide fuel cells with 50 percent efficiency at lowest capacity of 200 kilowatts and when overall efficiency can be improved when you use it with hybrid system and if you use direct methanol fuel cells we have an efficiency of 25 percentage and gas turbines have an efficiency of 46 percent and when you use combined cycle power plants we have an efficiency of 61 percentage and the reciprocating engine have an efficiency of 50 percentage so that is the comparison of efficiency for a typical fossil fuel power sources and the solid oxide fuel cells and i even introduced this word balance of plant in the previous lecture also so multiple fuel cell stacks are integrated with balance of power plant balance of plant to form a particular fuel cell system what is meaning by meaning of the balance of plant is so what is the meaning of balance of plant in fuel cells is the common balance of plant materials are say for example we are dealing with the air so we need an air compressor we need humidifier we need heat exchanger to heat the air to the operating temperature and we need several valves we need sensors we need sealants and we need conduits and hoses when i say conduits it's a pipe okay so that is for the common balance of materials for air management and with respect to fuels like hydrogen and oxygen we need gas metering units like uh, we need regulators we need recirculation pumps we need valves we need sensors we need again sealants for this and we need pipes and hoses for this also and with respect to fuel cell stacks we need bipolar pl plates we need sub gaskets we need membranes we need electrodes we need insulators coolants we need conduits and hoses okay so they all are common balance of plant materials under air management fuel management stack and with respect to integrating the things we need stack manifolds we need sealants we need conduits and hoses so all of them can be classified as uh, most of these them can be classified under the following categories like structural plastics, elastomers, coolants, assembly aids or metals and particularly the contaminating species relevant to them are heat stabilizers, plasticizers, assembly aids, solvents and others and this is a typical flow diagram of a fuel cell stack so except the fuel cell stack which you can see in the middle portion grey color so remaining thing are required to run a fuel cell plant right so they are all called as balance of plant so when you, you can see that here we have a cathode loop where we have water separator we have cathode humidifier we have air compressor we have a radiator coolant pump coolant loop is there and you have an anode loop we have hydrogen we have hydrogen recirculation pumps and we have pressure walls etc be balance of plant is everything else beside the fuel cell stack which is needed to fabricate a fuel cell power generation unit okay because when you have fuel cell stack we have external circuit is there you need other fuel supplying system so kind of things now we need gas gas flowers flow rate measurements we need fans valves we need cabinets we need heat exchangers we need humidity chambers we need heat temperature right so electrical controllers are required for these also right so if you want to measure the temperature humidity and gas flow we need electrical controllers for that and we need, we need fans valves and cabinets and heat exchangers so all of them in everything except the fuel cell stack are generally called collectively called as balance of plant okay And let us look into the cell component characteristics. And if you look at the cell component characteristics, they have high, any cell component should have a characteristic like high chemical stability. They should use excellent, they should have excellent electronic conductivity for electrodes and interconnects. And we should have excellent ionic conductivity and zero electronic conductivity for electrolyte and we, all of them all materials should have a matching thermal co expansion coefficient for individual components they should have excellent mechanical stability and all materials should be easy to fabricate with less cost 
and we should have a large range of temperature stability from room temperature to fabrication temperature and all these materials should have a chemical compatibility with each other and they should be easily available and at affordable cost and they, all these materials should have ability to prevent the leakage of the gases particularly for the electrolyte material and this electrode should have sufficient porosity so that gases like hydrogen in anode side or oxygen in the cathode side can diffuse easily and reach the reaction sites okay and if you look at these interconnectors for solid oxide fuel cells so particularly if you use for uh, planar structure and uh, if you use for tubular structure the design is easy for tubular structure but it is a bit complicated for uh, planar structure you can see the top interconnector and sub interconnector how it is being designed so that the electrons that is being generated at the anode site is being externally sent to the cathode site so the primary function of the solid oxide fuel cell interconnector material is to connect the anode of the one of the cell to the cathode of the next next cell in the electrical series so this interconnect also separates the fuel from the oxidant in the adjoining cell surface stack so thus this interconnect material must be chemically thermally stable in both the reducing condition as well as in the oxidizing condition that is at the anode side as well as in the cathode side they should be stable and they should not permit any gases to diffuse through it and they should be sufficiently electronically conductive to support the electron to flow at the given operating temperature okay we know that the solid oxide fuel cells are operated at 600 to 1000 degrees celsius so the interconnector material must be chemically as well as thermally com compatible with the all other cell components from the room temperature to those operating temperatures and even higher temperatures at which the fuel cell is being fabricated okay so the desired characteristics of an interconnectors are it should have stability, its ionic conductivity, its compatibility with others and uh, similar thermal expansion. It should be porous, porosity, high strength and toughness and low cost. Interconnectors, what is interconnector material which is used? As I told you, this interconnector material needs some desired characteristics. It should have good stability, conductivity, capability then thermal expansion along with other materials, the porosity and high strength and toughness and low cost. How wow, it should be, can you tell me? Stability, what about the stability? It should be chemically, morphologically and dimensionally stable. Okay, what about the conductivity? It should possess adequate electronic conductivity because the purpose is to pass the electrons. So electronic conductivity should be high and uh, compatibility it should be chemically compatibility other anode cathode materials okay and it should be chemical interaction or any elemental interdiffusion with this in between the interconnect and the adjoining components should not be there okay and with respect to thermal and expansion of this this should be the same range it should have a similar thermal expansion coefficient with other materials and what about the porosity the interconnector must be dense there should be no connected porosity because we don't want any gas to cross leakage which means that porosity should be ideally zero okay. so different materials are being used so this um, ab3 that is perovskite materials are even considered as the interconnector material exceptional properties such as dielectric ferroelectric piezoelectric magnetic catalytic and photovoltaic properties of perovskite materials opens new doors to many groundbreaking discoveries for unique devices ideas particularly these material properties are inherited from their crystal structures therefore the features can be tuned via varying the details of the crystal structures so in the literature lanthanum chromium oxide lco is one of the most examined perovskites for various purposes such as solid oxide fuel cells catalytic converters and sensors uh, high temperature alloys being considered as the material Okay, so we currently we uh, LACRO3 is being used as the SOFC interconnector material it's in some 40 45 years. Okay. Um, this particularly they have some attractive features. They have high electronic conductivity under fuel and oxidant atmospheres. So we have adequate stability in the fuel cell environment and uh, we have a reasonable compatibility with other components also. Okay. 
so we have useful thermodynamic data here and what are the properties of zirconium oxide and conductivity of stabilized zirconium oxide what is the thermal expansion data what are the properties of this abo3 perovskite so you have the property of yttrium stabilized zirconium okay so this uh, thermodynamic data has been taken from this textbook okay research book science and technology so if you look at uh, now we know about the solid oxide fuel cells looking at it the advantages associated with that it is mechanically simple because it is a solid state device like a fuel cell they operate at a high operating temperature which means that steam reforming can be done in internally also there is a option so we don't need any external reforming unit uh, number of units required cost of uh, capital cost is reduced and also it is a uh, fuel flexibility is there even you can directly feed the natural gas into the system and the reaction kinetics are very fast at high temperature we don't need a precious metal catalyst as a catalyst we can use the nickel or lithium stabilized zirconia as the anode also okay the heat produced in the fuel cell can be used to heat uh, heating the other processes in that uh, power plant and whatever steam is produced they can be used to drive the turbines and produce more electricity yes remember the operating temperature is 600 to 800 hmm? so water will be in vapor phase which means steam when you operate at high pressure you are having high pressure steam which can used to run the turbine and produce more electricity and the design is more tolerant of the impurities if co is present that also get uh, react to form the required uh, electrons that is it produce hydrogen and electrons also really and they are relatively resistant to small quantity of sulfur in the fuel in comparison to other type of fuel cell so that it means that we can even use coal gas that is by burning the coal whatever flue gas you get that also can be used as a raw material for here okay and if you look at the disadvantages associated with it this takes a longer time to start up right we have seen that high operating temperature means room temperature to operating temperature it will take certain time during that time we should have some alternative okay and uh, it must be constructed of robust heat resistant material because operating temperature is high radiation losses has to be reduced that means ceramic coatings has to be done to uh, have some uh, loss of heat okay so these ceramic material used are expensive to manufacture and they are fragile in nature so that is one of the challenge and they has to be shielded to prevent the heat losses due to uh, radiation and manufacturing costs of the solid oxide fuel cells are high compared to carbon gas turbine coal power plants okay and in the, another problem is uh, severe material constraints are there due to high operating temperature so you have to make use of stainless steel at low temperatures alloyed or lanthanum chromate material at the uh, temperature so okay and there is a good advantage like water management catalyst flooding slow oxygen kinetics are not a problem here because we are going to have good water management and even the presence of poisons like carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide are not a problem and it is it can do internal reforming also so any hydrocarbon or hydrogen containing thing can be used as a fuel okay and it's also environmental friendly there is no nox or sox production it's quite in operation and uh, high operating temperature efficiency you know and all solid state uh, conditions so it is easy to modularity is there and multiple fuel capacity is there relatively low maintenance cost for this type of operations okay so disadvantages if i think production cost is high degradation of the cell component due to high operating temperatures and difficult to make gas tight sealants in this lecture number 16 we have discussed about various component materials for solid oxide fuel cells and like what are the desired characteristics of anode material cathode material and electrolyte materials and we have seen what is the research and development that is taking place with respect to anode material or cathode material or electrolyte material for solid oxide fuel cells and we have seen what is an interconnector and what are the different for particularly for tubular uh, design of uh, the solid oxide fuel cell we are going to use uh, interconnectors so that interconnector materials and what is the desired materials and the characteristics of, to be desired characteristics of an interconnector have been discussed okay and we have seen what is an sealant and what is the significant of sealant in 
solid oxide fuel cells also right thank you so much for joining my classroom meet you in the next lecture bye bye